Germans were applying with devastating logic the first principle of successful modern warfare. The strike of the enemy's air bases and deny him their use, urgent steps had to be taken to protect the defenses of our aerodromes, and for this purpose the RAF regiment was formed. Hello and welcome to our five episode historical podcast series supporting our 8100 commemorations this year 2022 marking our 80th year of the RAF regiment 100 years since the formation of the RAF armoured car companies. Wayne and I had the honour to interview Wing Commander Tim Jones. I hope you enjoy. Hello, welcome. Um, my name is Spice Hunt Ed Dye. Um, this is the first of a small series of podcasts concentrating on the RAF regiment in uh, Dofa um, in the campaign in the 19, late 60s into the 70s. Um, with me here is Flight Lieutenant Wayne Horsewood, who's a, a joint terminal attack controller over at RAF Coningsby. So for people who aren't aware of that terminology, he is the bloke on the ground who calls in the airstrikes to get you out of the poop, hopefully. And then our honoured guest is um, retired Wing Commander Tim Jones, um, who served on RAF loan service to the Sultan of Oman's armed forces in the 70s um, in that Dofar conflict. So it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here uh, today, sir, and we're looking forward to hearing your story. Um, where should we start? I suppose with some historical context. So it's um, the 60s at the moment. Um, the, the current sultan in Oman is um, rules, very autocratic rule. There's dissent in the, the, um, the people in the Dofar region, which is around about the size of Wales. And there's an uprising. They take up arms and name themselves the uh, the DLF, the Dofar Liberation Front. Things progress. We move into the 70s, and um, now communist uh, China and Russia have um, now kind of sponsored and trained the DLF. Um, we've now got a a local militia which is um, equipped with AK variant weapons, very efficient in their home territory, they're natural soldiers, um, and they've now got expertise and training, anti-personnel mines, etc. And we've now named them, or they've named themselves the uh, the, P the P flag, which were uh, the popular front for the liberation of the occupied Arab territory. So a bit of a statement in itself, really, just in the title. Congratulations. So that, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. So... Um, I suppose really the first question uh, to kick us off is, um, you know, what really was the RAF involvement and, and how did, as a young officer, how did you see yourself, you know, thrown into that conflict? Okay. Uh, well, let's, let's go back to where you began at the beginning of this in the 60s. I served as a flight commander on 48th Squadron yep. and we were deployed to Aden, to Comaxa, on force protection of the large air base there. It was the end of the mountain campaign in the Ratfan, and at that time it was becoming a, a sort of terrorist campaign, really, down in, in, the, in the area of Kormaksa and the, and the city of the south of, uh, of Yemen. Um, I became aware of, of Dofar because the transport aircraft from Kormaksa used to fly up the Gulf and go to Salala, which is in Dofar, and Mazira, an island offshore, and then come back again. And they would go and support the RAF little detachments in those outlying positions. So I was aware of that because my roommate, who was a transport pilot, was forever coming in in the middle of the night with stories of where he'd just been and so on. And I thought it was quite exciting. And one day I managed to get a ride with him and fly up uh, to Salala. Uh, and it was an eye opener. I'd never seen anything like it. It was very primitive. Um, it was it was wild, really, and, and fascinating. And lo and behold, on this little RAF base were one or two British army officers wearing Arab uniform. And then I became aware that we did occasionally provide people to go on loan service to the Sultan's armed forces. And I was curious. Nothing more than that, just curious. But it stick, stuck with me. And gradually, I took more and more interest when I returned to UK and... I then deployed to the Far East and so on, but I never lost sight of what I'd seen there. And some years later, I inquired about going there on loan service and was told I couldn't, it wasn't available. 
and then it became available because in the 60s, you'll recall, uh, the UK was very much engaged in Northern Ireland, and the British Army, who had seconded opportunities in places like Oman, couldn't fill all the slots because they were too busy doing what they're supposed mm -hmm. to do in Northern yeah. Ireland. And so uh, three army vacancies were offered to the RAF regiment in the Sultan's Armed Forces. At the time, I was running J courses at Catrick. The prerequisite to go was that you had to have served on a regiment squadron and either done the platoon commander's course or the support weapons mortar course. I had done both and a forward air control course and one or two other things. So I was reasonably well qualified and excited by it. Unfortunately, I was also married with kids and that wasn't ideal because it was an active service deployment. You mm. knew that and you had to sign up for it. However, my wife eventually said, I think she sh I should go. I think I was making her life pretty impossible anyway. <laughs> so she agreed that I should go and I went. Uh, and so that's how it came about, really. I, of course, had read some of the background. I thought it was pretty exciting to do something like this. Um, and then having been told I was going, uh, the Sunday Times produced a great expose, a complete supplement on Britain's secret war in Dofar, mm -hmm. talking about how many casualties we were taking and how badly it was going and all the rest of it. That was not good news because my wife read it, so did I, and it was the first I'd read of a fairly large expose of what was going on. However, I was committed by then. So were two chums of mine, one from Catrick and one from Cyprus, who also were going to go, and we went. So that's how it set. That's how it came about, uh, and I was deployed out to Oman. I knew nothing much about the country, other than what I'd read, and it was a bit of an eye opener. Frankly, we arrived. Um, the air terminal was a tin shack with no walls, um, and a man with a stone on his pile of paper stamping your no objection certificate which allowed you into the country. It wasn't a visa, it was a no-objection certificate right. signed by His Majesty the Sultan. Right. Um, and we were met by a, a man in what had once been an RAF uniform with a rather green and dusty service dress hat and a large pair of pilot's wings who greeted us, threw our bags in the back of his jeep and said, we don't know who the hell you are, we're not expecting anybody from the bloody RAF regiment, but I've told to pick you up, you're booked in the R in the mess, and somebody will meet you in the morning, and that was it. We'd arrived. The following day, we had to unscramble it, because it had been assumed, because we were RAF, that we were coming to join the Sultan's Air Force. Ah. We weren't. We were supposed to be joining his army, but nobody had told the Air Force. Right. And so the army were expecting us, but we'd been hijacked by the Air Force, who were quite glad to get us because they wanted anybody they could get their hands on yeah. to help with the effort. Anyway, after a couple of days, we unscrambled it, we were allocated to our units, and I joined the Jebel Regiment in Oman. Right, yeah. And, and uh, I suppose it's important for context to know um, that the RAF involvement, or the RAF Regiment involvement, was, was twofold, really. You had the loan service, which you were involved in yourself, and then... The defence of Salala Airfield, which is you know classic RAF regiment operations, which was obviously with the you know the hedgehogs you know um, along that sort of plane um, before the high ground reaches up to you know where. Yeah, the... absolutely right. And the reason why the RAF were involved is simply because the old Sultan, who was a cunning and splendid old man in many ways, but also a bit of a pain, uh, he cleverly negotiated that the RAF could use his runway and island of Mazira right. as a strategic stepping stone to the Far East, where UK had residual defence obligations, yeah. in return for which he would ask the RAF to please look after his little air base at Salala, man it, air traffic control, and provide some seconded officers to fly his embryo Air Force aeroplanes. It didn't appear to be a big penalty to pay to the road, to the government of the day, and they committed to it. I think they regretted it shortly thereafter. But as a result of that, the RAF were committed to Salala. Uh, but P. Floag, as you rightly mentioned, began to flex its muscles and become quite a threat. And gradually, the threat to Salala became more and more severe. RAF regiment were deployed as a result, initially 
uh, a mortar flight and eventually a squadron yeah and then a series of squadrons in turn yeah similarly the army were upping their game an SAS squadron was deployed there yeah uh, to help train the local uh, surrendered enemy and so on but the whole picture was changing it was becoming far more visible there were more casualties yeah and it became an onerous task and it was finally balanced whether we would continue with it or not yeah however I'm glad to say we did continue with it. The opportunity for loan service increased. Uh, I was the first of the RAF, one of the first of the RAF regiment guys to go. We filled army appointments uh, and we were integrated into our army battalions as fully fledged company infantry officers. We didn't work alongside, we didn't work with the RAF regiment in Salala. That was a separate entity, although they were contributing to the Sultan's War. Right because they were defending the air base that he depended upon yeah. for air support. And I suppose at, at the time, public opinion back in the UK was largely irrelevant because no one knew about it, even even when that expose came out, it was heralded as a secret war. Well, it was heralded as that, but of course that blew the gaff on it. Right, yeah. And as a result, the, what they call the D notice, which had previously put a security clamp on it, yeah. was lifted. Okay. And therefore it began to be reported and there was more and more visibility of what went on, more yeah. accountability. And so everything that was done there began to be appear in the press. Yeah. You know, as a loan service officer, I wasn't best pleased with that because it meant my wife knew exactly what I was doing yeah. instead of me pretending I was helping training. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so, so what did that actually, uh, just for everyone, uh, everyone that's listening, so what did that actually mean, being a, a loan service officer to the Sultan's forces? What did that actually entail for you? Right. And I suppose how did that differ from the, the regular RF regiments that were units that were out there? Well, the RAF regiment deployment in Salala, the, the mortar flight originally and then a full field squadron, was not under command of the Sultan's armed forces. It was under command of the Royal Air Force. Uh, however, it was in full support of the Sultan's Armed Forces effort and was very much integrated into the total order of battle. Mm. So, for example, the regiment officers there would attend the daily briefing. Uh, their defence of the bear base was an integral part of the Sultan's effort. So it was a completely stitched up, agreed, supportive effort. But they were not under command. That was the big difference. I wore Arab uniform. I spoke Arabic every day. Uh, the chain of command was from me to my colonel, who was a lone service officer, but again in Arab uniform, commanding an Arab battalion within an Arab army, reporting to the Sultan. So I had Her Majesty on one side and His Majesty on the other. And did you say you'd done a very, a very short Arabic-speaking course before leaving the UK? or? Not before leaving the UK. You see, the, the RA, bear in mind, the RAF regiment had not historically done this. Right. And therefore, the RAF's experience of loan service in Oman was pilots. They did not need to speak Arabic because in the air it was all English. Yeah. And therefore, there was no internal Royal Air Force mechanism for a loan service officer to be taught Arabic. And it didn't appear to be necessary. They had failed to realise that I wasn't on loan service to the Air Force yeah. out there, was on, and therefore the need for Arabic didn't emerge until too late in the day yeah. when I arrived and discovered that I really needed to speak Arabic in a hurry. Yeah. And my colonel asked me, how did you get on on the Arabic course? I said, I didn't do it. <laughs> he was horrified yeah. Yeah. and yeah. immediately he arranged for me to do a two-week total immersion course in Arabic with the oil company, and I took with me the man who was destined to become my signaller and an escort, both of who couldn't speak English, and they lived in the room with me in the officers' mess, and we spoke Arabic every day to each other because there was no yeah. option. Yeah. And gradually I acquired a vocabulary um, and learned how to speak Arabic, or Mani Arabic, with them, as a result of which my Arabic is extremely vulgar and very <laughs> primitive, but I can make myself understood. Yeah. Yeah. Before we went to Iraq the first time, we, we had, a, had a chap from Exeter University come up and teach us some um, sort of very rudimentary Arabic, but we actually had like, the local news come and film us uh, before we deployed, and we're all kind of spouting off what we thought was really good Arabic. For anyone watching it, using a fluent Arabic speaker would be shaking their heads, thinking, you yeah. know, complete confusion. 
and, and, and we tried this dialect, you know, with the locals out there and, and they just look at you like, you know, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what you should say. I, I mean, I have to say, with, when I arrived in my battalion, I mean, it was this, an unusual mix. There were British officers, yes. About half of us were loan service. The other half were full-term contract officers, in other words, mercenaries. Yeah. Um, some of them spoke very good Arabic, others did not. But they were a mixed bunch uh, of background experience and motivation, frankly. Um, but a good outfit, a very good outfit. And that was the case throughout the armed forces there. They were a mix. There was also another nationality because the Sultan had recruiting rights in Baluchistan. We had quite a lot of Baluchi tribesmen oh, within right, yeah. the armed forces who spoke Urdu, not Arabic. Yes, yeah. Although most of them learned Arabic. And they were excellent soldiers, a bit like Afghan tribesmen. Yeah. Excellent soldiers, combat yeah. ready, fit, bearded, mountain tribesmen. Yeah. Ideal. Yeah. Most of our recruits came from date farmers and fishermen in the north of Oman. Right, okay. Not from Dofar. Yeah. The Dofari dialect is different. Yet your enemy you were fighting have lived and breathed in those hills. Absolutely. And that, you know, it's their backyard. Absolutely. That was their country. Yeah. It was the you know, ground of their choosing. Yeah. Uh, whereas for our people, it was a bit of a foreign thing. And they weren't best pleased, frankly, by being deployed down there, but they didn't have any option. Um, however... The integrated organisation, Baluchi, Arab, Omani, Brit, etc., contract, loan service, it sounds like an unholy mix. It actually worked very well. Yeah. People, there was nobody there who didn't actually really want to be there, or in the case of the date farmer's sons, had to be there for the tour. And it was amazing how well it worked, frankly. But I did find quite quickly that it was slightly different from being in any other armed force I'd seen in that you were judged on your merits at the time and you had to prove yourself before you were properly accepted. OK, yeah. Um, that was a bit of a tall order. Yeah. But it worked. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, what was the tour of duty for those, those Baluchi drivesmen, etc., you know, in the day for The Baluchi guys signed up a contract and normally they did three years. Oh, right. Many of them renewed and carried on and spent their life there. Really? Yes. Many of them married in Oman, were accepted, spoke good Arabic. One of them, I particularly remember, became the governor of a province in oh, Dover. Right. Okay. Um, and they, they were fully integrated. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Germans were applying with devastating logic.